Hello, lovely internet strangers. I am happy to bring you the next installment in an anti-feminist reads the feminist canon using the term feminist canon very loosely. For those of you who are new, this is a series where I read books that are from the feminist canon as well as a variety of books that relate to the topic of feminism, women's rights, women's place in the world, and gender relations in general. I'll also be reading what I would consider the anti-feminist canon, which is essentially a list of books I came up with because I couldn't find an anti-feminist canon list on the internet. The subject of this video is A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf, which was first published in September 1929. I'm sure most of my viewers have at least heard of this book. This is considered to be pretty much the first book in the modern feminist canon. To my knowledge, it is the first substantial work on female creatives, and it is definitely the definitive one. At this time in England, where Virginia Woolf lived, all women had received the right to vote the previous year, and the feminist movement considered its work to be finished since it had become almost exclusively connected with women's suffrage. As far as where this book sits in the feminist timeline, this was published after Women in Economics by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, which I discussed in a previous video, and it was published around the same time as Woman in the New Race by Margaret Sanger, which I also discussed in a previous video, but it was published a full two decades before The Second Sex by Simone de Beauvoir, which is pretty much feminism's magnum opus, so to speak. Feminist writing wasn't popular at the time. Wolf predicted that she would be attacked as a feminist, implied to be a sapphist and not taken seriously, but that she would get many grateful letters from young women for writing it. Some relevant author biographical information. Wolf was born to well to do parents. Her household placed an emphasis on education, in literature, writing. She was one of six children, educated at home. She received some higher education through the ladies department of King's College London. From age 13 when her mother died, she suffered from periodic mood swings, from severe depression to manic episodes. Her family referred to it as her madness. She was given a diagnosis of neurasthenia, which is no longer a diagnosis. This might now be called dysautonomia. She had no children, which is relevant to now because a lot of her arguments about why women have not contributed as much to the landscape of arts and literature has to do with the fact that they have been charged with the work of being mothers and keepers of domestic life. She engaged in affairs with women and dabbled in non-monogamous setups. She and her sister Vanessa were sexually abused by their half-brothers when they were children. We can only speculate on what impact that had, but I feel it's relevant to know. And she committed suicide at age 59, 12 years after she published Room of One's Own by placing stones in her pockets and walking into the river. She had made a few suicide attempts in previous years, so it wasn't completely a surprise. As far as the book structure, this is a little bit different than books like Women in Economics or Woman in the New Race, where they had an argument and then were following it up very specifically. This work is based on two lectures that Wolf delivered in October 1928 at Newnham College and Girton College, which were women's colleges at the University of Cambridge. She was asked to talk about women in fiction, and she chose to weave this fictional story as a frame to support her thesis and invents this fictional character as her stand-in. Her key argument in this book is that a woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. The amount she mentions specifically is £500 a year, which in current year is £32,000, which would be the equivalent of $40,000 US. The book largely consists of the frame story she has created with her fictional stand-in, moving through the higher education environment, trying to answer certain questions. Why women have been so poor and men so wealthy? Why have there not been female geniuses like Shakespeare? What are the solutions to these problems? And she discusses many other points about literature in general, differences between men and women in their writing. She talks about the gendered nature of the mind. Much of her writing is in this kind of signature stream of consciousness form. She says at one point essentially that there is perhaps more truth in fiction, that the message is easier to convey in a fictional form than just by giving a straight lecture. So I'll run through her main points here and anything I don't have time for can go into the next video. One of the first things she asks is, why have women been so poor and men so wealthy? Her character is talking to a friend of hers, lamenting the fact that so much money has clearly been poured into the men's colleges and not into the women's colleges, and this is because men leave the money to the colleges, so they clearly need women to leave money to the women's colleges, and why have they not been doing this? Obviously, Wolf knows the answer, but this is her technique to get the audience to think it through as well. Wolf realizes this would have meant a very radical change to women's lives because for a woman to amass the kind of money that gets donated to a college to create a department or something like that, this would necessitate the suppression of families altogether because of the nine months needed for pregnancy and that women then spend the first five years feeding and playing with their children, and this is very important 
shapes because human nature is shaped during this time. She also mentions the fact that for a long time, women didn't have the right to outright individually possess what they earned, so they probably wouldn't have bothered because their husbands would have just had control of whatever earnings they made. I know that there are likely reasons women didn't have the right to individually own property once they were married. The idea being that when you become married, you merge. There were a lot of negatives for men because women could go spend their money and men were on the hook for it. Anyway, I feel like that's a topic for a whole other video, but I did want to just touch on it a little bit. So her character having had these thoughts, she goes to the British Museum to research why men have been so wealthy throughout history and women so poor. And obviously she is talking about them having individual ownership over property because obviously women have benefited very greatly from the wealth of men over the years. You know, all the wives of rich men or even men with a modest amount of wealth. They were fed, clothed, given luxuries, etc. So she notices that men aren't just writing biological texts about women, but they write about women constantly in fiction. But she noted that women weren't writing books about men and asked, quote, why are women, judging from this catalog, so much more interesting to men than men are to women? There could be many reasons for that. It could be that women are new to the art of writing and they want to write about what they know, which is themselves, their gender. Perhaps women influence the lives of men, psychologically speaking, more than men influence the lives of women. She notes that there are these professors writing about women who are very angry and that, quote, the books have been written in the red light of emotion and not in the white light of truth. And she criticizes the professors for writing this way because he should be doing so dispassionately, thinking only of the arguments and not of himself and his own emotions because his emotions will affect the reader. She was affected by his anger. And she makes the point that perhaps when professors insisted on women's inferiority that they were actually more concerned with protecting their own superiority and that life is hard for both sexes, they need self-confidence and it's easy to generate that self-confidence by thinking that other people are inferior to you. So then she talks about the money component, about financial security and freedom and the impact that has on an artist. She's talking mainly about writers, but I'm going to use the word artist because she also does mention musicians, painters, etc. Essentially creative types, so I'm using the word artist. So her character reflects on the fact that she used to have to work these odd jobs and it really sucked, but now she gets 500 pounds a year from an aunt who died. She complains that she always had to do this work that she didn't want to do, which is like, okay, boo-hoo, honey, you and everyone else. And then it used to eat away at her, but now that she can pay for things, now that she has financial security, that removes the hatred and bitterness that she had inside. She says, quote, I need not hate any man. He cannot hurt me. I need not flatter any man he has nothing to give me. She makes a distinction between men and women here saying that women in general and herself are content with the 500 pounds a year, but that men are driven to conquer and take and they have an instinct for possession and rage for acquisition. They will slave away to make more and more money when they really don't need that much. Wolf's fictional stand-in notes that looking at all these books in the imaginative space in fiction, woman is highly important, but quote, practically she is completely insignificant significant. That you don't see her in history, but you see her all the time in poetry. She says, quote, some of the most inspired words, some of the most profound thoughts in literature fall from her lips. In real life, she could hardly read, could scarcely spell, and was the property of her husband. And she says there's a lack of facts about the day-to-day -day lives of women in history. She says, quote, she never writes her own life and scarcely keeps a diary. There are only a handful of her letters in existence. She left no plays or poems by which we can judge her. Wolf wants the day-to-day -day details. Did she do the cooking? Did she have a room to herself and she finds it deplorable that nothing is known about women before the 18th century that she has no model. She references a man who said it was impossible for any woman past, present, or to come to have the genius of Shakespeare and she thinks that he's right at least that in Shakespeare's time it would have been impossible for a woman to write the works of Shakespeare because she wouldn't have been educated even if she was extraordinarily gifted that her parents would have thwarted any attempts for her to study by herself and would have forced her to get married, and she paints the scenario of this fictional sister of Shakespeare. Possibly she runs away to London, but if she tried to get an acting job, she'd be laughed at. She probably would have ended up pregnant by one of the actor managers and then killed herself. And she says, quote, genius like Shakespeare's is not born among laboring, uneducated, servile people, which kind of brings up this issue that Wolf is largely talking about women of a certain class, which is why in current year, when intersectional feminism is the dominant 
dominant feminist ideology of the day. Virginia Woolf is more of historical importance rather than who we currently look to for feminist thought because she's not engaging with the experience of all women. She's writing very specifically about female artists and she thinks that female artists can only come from a certain class with a certain level of education and this is kind of a very narrow issue as far as women are concerned. But she says regardless of women not being supported that women must have had that genius within. She even thinks that many of the poems signed Anon were written by women. She thinks witches and wise women must have had genius and even the mothers of geniuses but that any woman with genius in that time who tried to use her gift for poetry would have been thwarted by people. She would have been plagued by contrary instincts and would have gone crazy. Trying to write under the conditions that she had to live under would have warped her work with the stress. This leads me to her next point which is that you have to have a certain state of mind to make works of genius. She holds up Shakespeare as someone who had this most favorable state. She says it's hard to know because artists didn't write about their state of mind at that time but that later writings by artists reveal that it's incredibly difficult to write a work of genius, that life circumstances get in the way, the world doesn't care if you succeed, but that Shakespeare's work is genius because you don't see any of Shakespeare in it. So then she comes to the concept of women having a room of their own as she alludes to in the title of the work. She says women wouldn't have a room of their own unless their parents were rich, which I would say men don't necessarily have a room of their own. I suppose they could rent a flat maybe, but like if you were a poor man or even a man of modest means, you were sharing your bedroom with your wife, possibly he might have had a study, but that still seems like something that is reserved for men of a certain social class. I suppose since she's talking about this social class, she's saying that even among people of that class, the man gets the study and the woman doesn't. But I feel like at that time, like she says, if her parents were rich or she marries into a certain social class, she might have a sewing room, something, and she could go in there and write. When addressing the question of material wealth as something she says is essential for artists. She quotes a professor who says the great poets of the last 100 years were all university men except for three of them and of those three only Keats wasn't well to do. That the poor poet doesn't have a chance. Quote, little more hope than the son of an Athenian slave to be emancipated into that intellectual freedom of which great writings are born. So that intellectual freedom is dependent on material wealth, financial freedom, and poetry depends on intellectual freedom. And women have always been poor since the beginning of time. So women have had less intellectual freedom than the sons of Athenian slaves. And that is why she places so much emphasis on women having money and a room of one's own. However, my favorite part of the book is when she gives women some tough love, some harsh truths which you would never hear a feminist say today. She's talked about women throughout history and how they've gotten here, etc. But essentially chastising women for not taking advantage of the opportunities they have been given in recent years. She says, quote, You are, in my opinion, disgracefully ignorant. You have never made a discovery of any sort of importance. You have never shaken an empire or led an army into battle. The plays of Shakespeare are not by you, and you have never introduced a barbarous race to the blessings of civilization. What is your excuse? It's all very well for you to say we have had other work on our hands without our doing the seas would be unsailed in these fertile lands a desert we have born and bred and worked and taught and that takes time and wolf says that's true but that there have been quote two colleges for women in existence in england since the year 1866 and that after the year 1880 a moneyed woman was allowed by law to possess her own property and that in 1919 which is a whole nine years ago she was given a vote and may i also remind you that most of the professions have been open to you for close on 10 years now when you reflect upon these immense privileges and the length of time during which they have been enjoyed, and the fact that there must be at this moment some 2,000 women capable of earning over 500 pounds a year in one way or another, you will agree the excuse of lack of opportunity, training, encouragement, leisure, and money no longer holds good. And I was like, yo, Virginia Woolf, you are savage right now. One of Woolf's last points in her work is that in 100 years time, so 2029, women will have 500 pounds a year and rooms of their own. And she says that writers must relate to reality, not to the world of men and women and then opportunity will come and Shakespeare's sister will live aka a woman of genius 
will create. Now, do I agree or not? I don't think she's wrong in saying that having more money and space for yourself allows you more intellectual freedom and makes it easier for you to create and write. But she and I disagree about what genius is. She has this idea that the genius work must be uncorrupted by personal issues, by emotion. But I think that many of the great works of genius have been not only created despite the author's personal circumstances, but perhaps could only have been written because of the personal circumstances. It also seems like she's not just making a point about female geniuses, but just women being able to write in general. She mentions all these women now making money off of their writing, which is definitely happening now. There are plenty of women in journalism, especially since the advent of online journalism, women who are bloggers, who make money working from home, which is convenient for them because of the motherhood issue. And I want to address that because it is an issue that came up in Women in Economics. It was the main issue in Women in the New Race, and she touches on it in this book, but maybe not with the emphasis that should be there, because really the only practical difference between the circumstances of men's life and women's life that cannot really be changed easily is motherhood. If the issue was just that women needed training on how to write, that would be one thing. But it's also not that women have to become mothers. Even in current year, when birth control is widely available, women still want to have children and they don't just want to pop out the children, plop them in a nursery and let someone else take care of them while they go sit and write. They want to nourish their children. As Wolf says, the first five years are particularly important. As far as my buy, borrow, bypass writing, I think this one is a borrow. It's pretty short, but it's written in this kind of frame story that's kind of hard to parse sometimes. And I think you can get the main points from listening to me talk about it, but it's not a bypass. It is a seminal text of the feminist canon. I'm glad I read it. It was very interesting to read these points being made by a woman in 1929 when women are still writing about this issue. And it's really easy to look at what people are writing now and think it's like some new idea or where did this come from when actually there are no new ideas that usually have roots somewhere else. I would be interested to know what Wolf would think in current year now that women do have readily available birth control. If we brought Wolf to current year, she'd be looking at a very different landscape of career options and opportunities for women. And I wonder what she would think about how unhappy many women are. I don't think she would be unhappy. I think she would be very happy because I think she is a particular kind of rare woman. I'm going to follow this video up with some other interesting points from the book, and I'm going to discuss an article that I saw published recently in The Guardian, that esteemed outlet, that touches on this exact point. I thought it would be interesting to look at a piece being written now to see if Virginia Woolf's dream has been realized. Spoiler alert, it has not, because women are still bitching about the issue, or rather, feminists are. Thank you for watching. If if you like this video, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe, and I hope to have more content for you very soon.